much, mm -hmm. but, um, but you can. I found a room and took all my speakers. Oh, it says it's sure. recording. We may be live already. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> well, he came in and did Rob? Yeah, he just uh, okay. I just like said it would turn it out. Yeah. Oh. That's what Chuck did you get recording or streaming? What's it streaming? He on start streaming, so he said just hit to... We want stream it's because it's it says it's recording. We just want recording, don't we? Yeah. We're not streaming, are we? No, uh -huh. we're not streaming. I don't know. Okay. No, okay. Well, you're not live. <coughs> yeah. Right. You're our So we're recording, we're but we're not streaming. So if that's where we're supposed to be, we're right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I'm not responsible for the technical difficulties. Well <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, neither are you. He had it on that he said start streaming, he said just punch it. Yeah, but we're supposed to be recording because that's where we are with it. Uh, appreciate the skill that they have in doing that oh, yes. with regard to the language and, uh, and the obligation that we have. Uh, we're in John chapter 3, and I think we're streaming, aren't we? It says it was recording. recording. Well, we're, supposed supposed to be we're supposed to be streaming. We're supposed to be recording. We're recording. We're recording. It's going out. Okay. 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 First, it was some failure. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, so that's, you're not going to bill us for coming by for that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tech support. Tech support. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Father, we confess our need for a greater faith, for deeper love. More than that, Father, a greater knowledge of you. Help us as we study your word to always be mindful of the fact that it is your word and that we are recipients of it in Christ. Amen. Amen. We gave you an assignment this morning, and the assignment was John, 3, 1, John chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at John chapter 3. Hopefully we'll be able to get into our study there and uh, we'll be able to move into the language of John chapter 3. Ask the average member of the church what the new birth is and what are they going to say? Baptism. 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 Right or wrong, that's included. But there's more to it than that. Uh, there are some things to be looked at in John chapter 3 that need to be mastered. And if we can master it, uh, you can't explain what you don't understand. So in study, you're trying to get an understanding so you can be able to explain it. And there is reason why we do not understand some passages. And it's because we forget some things about them. Let's start a little differently. Let's deal with the man Nicodemus. Who and what was Nicodemus? Pharisee. Pharisee and member of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Or Hedron, which is it? Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he was, but even more than that, when you look at this text, you learn something about this man. Now later on, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Where was he following the death of Jesus? He was having his burying. He and Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, they go and they take and they prepare the body of Jesus for burial and bury him in Joseph's new tomb. Uh -huh. We learn something about Nicodemus along the way. And he is called what kind of a disciple? Probably a secret. Secret. That's the biblical term. He and Joseph of Arimathea were both called secret disciples. Well, someone says, well, how could they do that? Well, you've got to give them some credit with regard to what's happening in their world and what they are facing. They had some conviction with regard to the Messiah based on Old Testament promise and prophecy. And when you touch that subject, you find yourself saying promise and prophecy. The promises made by God, how many of them were fulfilled? All of them. All of them. All of them. Not a one of them failed. <clears throat> you had first the land promise, the nation promise. Nothing failed according to Joshua chapter 25, 21. 
but the nation promise or the seed promise, where will you get a hold of the language dealing with the seed promise in the New Testament? One chapter that just reaches up and challenges you to master it from one end to the other. It's Galatians chapter 3. Write that down in your notes. You'll get it one of these days. Galatians 3. But now Nicodemus, after a while, is identified as a secret disciple. He is a disciple, but he does not make it known that he is a disciple. Uh, he does make it known in the eventually in the transaction where he takes and participates in the burial of Jesus. But here's a man that comes from comes to Christ and he comes at what time? Right. At comes at night. We can speculate as to why. We know good reason why some men do that. They do not want to seem publicly associating with, with someone, so they come at night. I just couldn't get off in time and come here. He couldn't get off earlier to come, to come and be there. But his statement about Jesus, what he says about Jesus is, is powerful. What does he say? We know you come from God. First word. Rabbi. Uh, after that, Rabbi, next word. We know. We. Apparently there were what? Multiple people. There were other people who had the same conviction that he did. We know that you are a what? Teacher. A teacher come, come from God. God. Well, what do you base your conclusions on, Nicodemus? He expresses it. No man, no ordinary man, no man without gifts and power can do what you do except do the what? They come from God. It's the signs that you do, the miracles that you do, except they come from God. And you'll find that that's the emphasis of the New Testament. Jesus himself said that he did the miracles that they might know that he is the Christ. Uh, the miracles were done. John says the miracles are recorded so that you may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus makes an unusual statement to Nicodemus. What is it? John 3. Be born again. Read it for us. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God. All right. Anyone have a different rendering in your translation? What about your footnotes? Does it say anything in the footnotes? That's a different nature. <clears throat> born again could rightfully be translated how? From above. Born from above. Or, or <laughs> born from above. <laughs> Except you be born from above, you cannot do what? See the kingdom see of God. Kingdom. You cannot see, see the, kingdom of God. the kingdom of God. And the word see is not, okay, put your glasses on so you can see, right. but rather it's the idea you cannot behold. behold. You cannot behold the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is normal. He is not educated in the technical language, if you will, that... Uh, some of us think we're educated in. Uh, what was his reply? How can a man be born again? And just go back in the womb and be born. All right. Yeah. The physical birth. Can he? And his thinking is he. You hear something about birth. He thinks of being born as he was born as an infant. How many of you were there the day you were born? I was there. Just didn't know I was there. You. <laughs> I find it rather interesting. You can talk to the children. Our, uh, our, our son would say, well, I was there. I was there. <laughs> and I remember thus and thus. Well, he was there, but he does not remember thus and thus. But he says, if you are, if you are not, how can a, how a man be born again? How can he, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? So Jesus corrects him. But does not say, let me correct you. How does it, what does he say? The next verse, verse 5. Most certainly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot he enter. Cannot enter. The you cannot of God. behold it. That's verse 3. Unless you're born from above. You cannot enter it unless you are born of the water <coughs> and of the Spirit. And we immediately began to complicate ourselves trying to pull together explanation 
that is not given in that text. You have the basics. There is a need for you to be born from above, born as directed by God. And that birth involves the water and the spirit. And he emphasizes down through verse 9 the absolute imperative that you be born again. But there's something missed most of the time. Now I'll use my term 99 times out of 4. Mm -hmm. Most people miss the point that is being made in verse 5. What's he talking about in verse 5? You see it, it's obvious, as plain as the nose on your face. He's talking about entering the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, when you read a phrase like that, you ask yourself the question, all right, how do I determine what that means? Well, here's a question to raise. Are there other passages in the New Testament that talk about entrance into the kingdom? Yes, Give me one. Uh, yeah, the phrase is going to ask yeah. that. So. You know it. You've got the answer. Well, um, um, I think about one with the use of that word kingdom itself, but uh, uh, you've got, of course, the uh, um, Great Commission that involves... The Great Commission is where we have to finally go. Yeah. But we're talking about passages that actually use this expression, talk about entrance into the kingdom. Kingdom, okay. Now here's, here's where we are. I've got it over here, but I'm over here. Matthew 7, 21. Oh, okay. Here it is, Matthew 7, 21. And Matthew 18. Mm -hmm. I'll erase it over here so you'll get it. Confused by it. John chapter 3 is talking, and the language is talking about entrance into the kingdom. So, whatever else I'm going to say, and whatever else is going to be added to the conversation, there of necessity is the obligation that we look carefully at the passages that talk about entering the kingdom. Now, John 3 5 says, Except you be born of the water and the spirit, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom. Now, the language is not that uh, it's a different set of language in Matthew 7. Uh, read Matthew 7, 21 for us. Mm -hmm. See, you got it? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you just need to be sincere and you'll enter the kingdom, right? Nope. Uh, you need to be religious and you'll enter the kingdom. No. Uh, you just need to be dedicated and you'll enter. No, that's not what it says, is it? Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord. Now, in our language, that's an easy sentence to read. But in that day and age, when someone calls someone Lord, it was so large that it was a life-altering, heart-controlling concept. You're not talking about a man from Nazareth. You're talking about the Lord. You're not talking about a man named Jesus. You're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the emphasis. But as Jesus says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Uh, in our day and age, most people will say, Oh, Lord. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. I grew up in a religion that uh, the people would come and they would pray. And they'd pray out loud. And they'd lift up hands and they'd cry out, Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, save me. Oh, Lord, do this. Lord, Lord. Is that what Jesus is? He's dealing with the concept of calling out, saying the right thing. Now, keep your finger in Matthew 7 and go down to, is it Matthew 13? I'm asking the question now, Matthew 13, about verse 15. Isn't it, isn't it said, something said there? Matthew 13. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes are closed. Yeah. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. Now back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. This people draw nigh to me with their what? 
mouths. Mouth. Yeah. And they honor me with their lips. lips. But their heart is far from me. But their heart is far from me. So, anything wrong with honoring the Lord with your mouth and with your lips? No. But in connection with that, what must be always vitally connected? Heart. The heart. The heart. Now, you've got to occupy your mind with the concept of that language there. The heart is what must be the origin of any pronouncement we make. And what we do must be from the heart. Now, I can give you another passage if you want it. You may or may not want it. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. But I want you to look at that language in Matthew 13. Matthew 7, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. Okay. Uh, being sincere is not enough. Correct. Saying the right things is not enough. Suppose someone says the right thing, but his heart is not in it. It's not enough. So it makes it clear that you must be born from above. You must be born of the water and the spirit. In other words, from... And let's do a little work on that word spirit for a moment. Your spirit is what? What is your spirit? You know the answer. You just don't know it as you know it. I'm, and someone said, we've got to say, give you the answer you want, right? Give me the answer that I want. What is your spirit? Your soul. Comes from soul and spirit are used interchangeably. It comes from the deepest level of our being. It is who you are at the deepest level of your being. Conversion involves the words and the deeds, but above all else, it involves who you are at the deepest level of your being. Now, in this context, in this language in Matthew 13, the heart is used and juxtaposed as synonymous with the spirit, who you are at the deepest level of your being. You know, one of the things we face in worship, and you know, well know this as a leader in worship, is we fall into dull routines. We fall into bad habits. Uh, after a while, it's difficult for us, after many, many, many exercises that we call worship, for us to really worship because we forget that it must come from the deepest level of our being. So we have our routines and we have this, that, and the other. And the problem is, is we really do not concern ourselves with worshiping God from the deepest level of our being. And when it comes to conversion, we talk about here's what you must do, but here's the, the imperative. It must be done from the deepest level of our being. There was a lady by the name of Dorothy Brown mm -hmm. that came to me. Dorothy came to me, she was in her mid to late 70s. She said, Ronald, I have a problem. I said, what is it? She said, I was baptized, and she gave me the date and the time and how old she was. But she said, I did it for the wrong reason. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I wanted to please my new husband so much that I did it to please him. And she said, I've lived all these years with an awareness that the day I was baptized, everything that I did was to win his love and affection even more and to draw him, he and I, together. And we've had a wonderful life. And they've been married 50 plus years. But she said, I did it for the wrong reason." I want to do it for the right reason. And I want to do it with all of my heart. Was she wise in doing that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doing what she knew was right, doing it from the heart, correcting it. Now, what happens, and I pardon me for taking too long with the point, the emphasis of that text has to do with the realization that we're, we're coming up across the language of Scripture and we're looking carefully at what people must do and we ignore that it must be from the heart. Mm -hmm. It must be from the deepest level of our being. You had a comment? Well, I just kind of a question to raise as well, but um, I'm with you on that. I certainly agree with what you're saying. Um, another aspect or thought of this, <clears throat> you know, the, the spirit here in this one is capitalized, yep. uh, which lends itself to some personage. And in verse six, you can see too how it's capped and it's not capped there. So, yep. you know, you may, 
be want to address that a little bit or give a slant on that a little bit or I've, I've got a thought but I'll say well that. sometimes the translators and you'll have some translations you can compare them side by side and mm -hmm. you'll find that some of them every time the word spirit is, is there it's capitalized well that's unfortunate because sometimes it's not talking about the Holy Spirit but now there's a reality the message of the spirit is aimed at what our spirit yeah the directions that the Holy Spirit gives are to be wed to our spirit, who we are, mm -hmm. at, at our deepest level of response. So we are to be led by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, at the deepest level of our being. Now the Holy Spirit leads us always in complete harmony with the Word. That's right. Now there's some argue here, and let me pardon while I chase this. Some groups say the Holy Spirit operates totally separate and apart from the Word. All right, what's your question whenever they make that observation and when they, they, they are being led by the Spirit to say this or do this? What's your question? If it's separate and apart from the Word, how do you know it's the Spirit? Yeah. I worked with a Pentecostal preacher. He's now a gospel preacher. He obeyed the gospel. Uh, and the question he couldn't get away from was, he, he, the, the Spirit gave, laid this on my heart. God told me to say this. And God told me to do that. And I know it's right in God. And he said, God would not let me be deceived. Well, God gave you the Word so you wouldn't be deceived. But if you look at it, he says, the Holy Spirit operates separate and apart from the Word. The automatic question is, is how do you know it's the Holy Spirit? Now, stay with those people. Don't tell them your conviction with regard to it. But ask them, what you know with regard to their course of action. How do you know it's the Spirit? Then there are others who come along and say the Spirit always operates separate, always operates totally, only through the Word. Does the Holy Spirit operate through the Word? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit operate only through the Word? Well, if He does, He bears witness with our Spirit that we're the sons of God. Only through the Word, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, wait a minute. And he makes intercession for us with groanings that we can't utter, Romans chapter 8. Mm -hmm. What do you know? That's the Holy Spirit doing something. And the Word tells us about it. Then there's the third position that I think is the right position. Everything the Holy Spirit does is in total, full, complete harmony with the revealed will of God. It's not separate and apart. It's not only through, but it's always totally in harmony with. Now the man who says, I, I think this. Well, he may have a reason for thinking it. The question is, what do the Scriptures teach? Right. Here's what the Holy Spirit said. And what the Holy Spirit is directing us to do has been revealed. And what the Holy Spirit is calling us to know and do must be through the Word. Do you see the point that I'm making? Everybody say, uh-huh, thank you. <laughs> it's always in complete harmony with the Word. The new birth is the birth of our spirit as directed by the Holy Spirit. It's not either or, it's both in that language of John chapter 3. But you go to Matthew 7. Matthew seven twenty one. Jesus says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the what? Kingdom. What's he talking about? He's talking about entering the kingdom, but... He who does what? The will of my Father. The will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he elaborates from verse 22 on. And the whole elaboration has to do with the wise man does what? He hears these sayings of mine, these words of mine. And he does them. And he's like the man who builds his house upon the rock. And we're all familiar with that. I used to have the young people sing that song and they'd be embarrassed. They build their house upon a what? The rock. It does. It stands solid. Where do we build for our spiritual security? On the will of God, the word of God, the revealed will of God. But the man who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. Now there's the rub. There's the problem in the vast majority of religions churches in our land today. Uh, they posit the concept of your experience 
and what you felt. In fact, I had one man, no need of elaborating what he was, but he made this observation finishing a two-hour study. He was dealing with passages he did not want to deal with. <laughs> the Great Commission, Acts chapter 2, Acts 22, Acts 16. And when we got through with all those passages, well, I cannot and will not set those passages aside. But this is a quote. And he was a leader in a religious group. He said, I would not exchange what I feel right here, bad at his heart, or where his heart's supposed to be, for all the Bibles in the world. What's more, most important, the way he feels in his what? His heart. And I was too young to know better. I looked at him and I said, you know, that's interesting. Did you know that what you just patted is, you're, you're talking about your heart? He said, yeah. I said, your heart has no sensory nerves, let alone any sense. Oh, he got upset with me. The Bible heart is where? Mind. From the neck up. Mm -hmm. It's the mind, the heart, the mind, the spirit. But now, if you want to stay with Matthew 7, does Matthew 7, 21 clear up just everything with regard to John chapter 3? No, but it does do what? It sheds some light on it. And what are you trying to get when you're studying a passage? What are you trying to provide for others who are looking at a passage? You're trying, trying to provide light. Now give me another passage. You got that one real good, Matthew 7, 21. Now give me another passage that talks about entering the kingdom. Matthew 18. 18 what? 1 through 3. 1 through 3. <laughs> I think I put it on the board, didn't I? Yes, Matthew 18. Well, so you're so timid you won't even tell me. Matthew 18, 1 through 3. And what's Jesus talking about in Matthew 18? Let's read it. Greg, read it for us. At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. How in the world can you enter the kingdom? According to Matthew 18. Converted and become like little children. Here's what's interesting. The word convert, you got a center column reference. The word convert... Is Matthew nineteen fourteen? No, Matthew eighteen. Matthew eighteen. Tell me that the reference here seems to indicate Matthew nineteen fourteen. Yeah, do not forbid the little children to come to me, for mm -hmm. all such, mm -hmm. all such. Does that mean that they're from diapers up? No, he's not talking about that. What's he talking about, Matthew nineteen fourteen? What what characteristic of children uh, is part and parcel of being a disciple of Jesus? What's what characteristic of a child? is characteristic of a disciple. Innocence. 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 Yeah. Obedient, humble. humble. Teachable, Teachable. Humble. Yeah. Obedient. Well now, are you stretching too far beyond the text to say those things, except you become as a little child? Now, how close is that to the day <coughs> of one's one physical birth? <coughs> okay. I'll ask another question. How old is one how old does one need to be in order for them to obey the gospel? You ever had that question asked? Mm -hmm. Youngest person you all ever saw baptized in this building here, well, how old were they? Eight or nine. Eight or nine. Eight or nine. Yeah. When they can really so speak of age accountability or, or either is your mind is maybe mature enough to understand. Yeah. We know right and wrong a lot of times for a little kid, but it's like when it comes to this, yeah. you know. Yeah. My son came to me when he was 11 years of age. Dad, I want to be baptized. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm thrilled. I'm so pleased. I want you to do something for me. I want you to read and study Romans chapter 6. And when you have read it enough, we'll get together and study it. Okay. Off he went. Mm -hmm. About six months later, he came back. <laughs> He'd forgotten about Romans 6. Dad, I, 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 want, I, I want to be baptized. I said, well, 
I want you to be, but I want you to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I said, let's get Romans 6. And we sat down and we read it. And we went through it point by point by point by point by point. I said, I want you to think about that. And then I want you to come back and we'll talk about it. Off he went. Almost a year later, we had a gospel meeting. And on the next to the last night of the meeting, Kenneth Hoover was doing the preaching. Ronnie came forward to be baptized. Wasn't a dry eye in the house, including his. And when he went, after he was baptized, he said, you know, Dad, I was about to give up on you. <laughs> I said, do you understand what I was doing? He said, I think I do now. You wanted me to understand what I was doing, and it had to be obedience from the heart. And I did the same thing with my 87-year-old mother who wanted to please me. I said, Mom, it's not to please me. You, you need to understand why. And, yeah. yeah. But she finally did. But here he is with a child's heart, but also a, a, a lack of understanding. So you take the child's heart and uh, you don't, he doesn't need to understand it, right? Is anyone willing to say that? He's got a child's heart, he's got a, an innocence, he, he's teachable, but he's not willing to go beyond just the desire to be baptized. Right. Anything wrong with that? Execute what you know. That's right. You become of age. That's your life just starting at that point. So I have a little work that I do with people who want to be baptized, especially young people. I, I ask them, tell me what repentance is. Their eyebrows go straight up. <coughs> huh? What is repentance? Now, why would I bring that up? Why would I bring repentance up? especially to a child who just wants to be baptized. Mm -hmm. Why would I bring that up? Because in Acts 2 what? 2.38. 38, the believers were told to repent and be baptized. Now suppose they said, no, wait a minute, we don't know what repentance is. Do you think Peter would have taken time to explain to them what repentance was or is? Yes. And when you deal with this whole subject, can one repent who does not know what repentance is? No, no, not truly. And one, but one who is innocent, teachable, and humble, they want to know what does it mean to confess? What does it mean to repent? What does it mean to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? And what does water have to do with it? Do you want to explain it to them or say, that doesn't matter? <clears throat> no, I, I don't, wouldn't think you'd want to do that at all. Do you want them, what does water have to do with it? I think it's obedience. It's not really yeah, water, it's water, obedience. Not physical water, as much as just obeying. Maybe. But, uh, you're, you're, you're almost quoting a passage, but you need to connect it. Uh, 1 Peter 3.21 uh, Peter makes it very clear that what's involved in, in baptism, it is the interrogation of a good conscience. Now, wait a minute. Baptism is involved with the conscience. It's belief. Belief that is moved to a, a, an area of, of understanding. A, 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 an understanding that is moved to the context of uh, the conscience and the conscience involves you in repentance which is an act of what? The conscience and baptism itself is the interrogation of the conscience before God, 1 Peter 3.21. And someone says you're making it complicated. No, no. Pull together everything said about it. You, you do the will of God, Matthew 7.21, in order into the kingdom. And how do you do that? By hearing and doing what God has taught. Uh, Jesus himself said, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he that does the will of my Father is in heaven. 
He also said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not, do not the things that I say, Luke. Luke something. I'm six and you're 46. Does that get it? 46, Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things that I say? And in Matthew 18, he says, Except you convert. And this is interesting. The word convert is active, not passive. One translation renders it, except you be converted. That makes it passive instead of active. Except you convert, except you turn. So what is involved in entering the kingdom? It is turning from self and from sin and turning to God. With what kind of orientation? Innocence, humility, conscience, obedience to the will of God. Am I making it too complex? No, it's just uh, it's, it's repentance. That's what that's all about. All right. And repentance is an absolute requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, is repentance talked about in John chapter 3? Not directly, but what do you know about the birth of one's spirit? If the spirit is not convicted, con convinced and convicted, is it possible for one to obey? If one does not understand the will of God, can one obey it? No. So understanding is necessary in obedience, Matthew 7, 21. Understanding and turning from sin to God is required, Matthew 18, verse 3. Time's going to get away from us. 13, 3. So Pardon? Except you repent, you all like those spirits. And, and there, here's the question. When you start dealing with any subject like the new birth, you've got to deal with all the subjects you're dealing with Jesus as the author of eternal salvation to all of those who well. obey, him. obey him. Matthew 5, 8, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. I want you to go to one more passage. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're not, by no means done with this subject, but I'm hoping or you're getting a hold of it. Can you, see, can you see that there's more at stake involved in this whole process? This is going to push you to the precipice. It's going to push you to the edge when you begin looking at the language of the text. And it's powerful, extremely powerful. Now, I'm rather rather intrigued by the language. Uh, let's, let's go back up. We'll start verse 13. I'll do some, I'll do some, you got a better voice than me. Read verse 13 down through verse 21. Is this the first chapter of 1 Peter? 1 Peter, page 42. <clears throat> Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who is without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold mm -hmm. from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He intended, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Stop right there. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have time to look at all of these verses, but I want you to look at just for a moment. Hope, verse 13. Revelation, verse 13. Obedience, verse 14. Conforming, verse 14. Uh, holy, verse 15 and 16. Calling on the Father, verse 17. Conduct yourselves... Uh, in, in fear, verse 17, knowing that you were redeemed uh, with, from, with not redeemed by corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, verse 18 and 19. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. You who believe in God, who raised him from the dead. But verse 22, Chuck, start with verse 22 and go through verse 25. Since, uh, since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of brethren, 
loving another uh, fervently with a pure heart. Now hang on. Read this right, the next verse. <laughs> Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is, is as grass, and all glory of man as of the flowers of grass, the grass withers and its flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you, but now go back to the language of verse 22 and 23. You have purified your souls, how? Obeying the truth. In obeying the truth, the word of God. And that was through the Spirit. The Spirit gave the word. You're obeying whose word? The word of the Holy Spirit. And you did it in sincere love. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Childlike heart. Mm -hmm. Childlike heart. Childlike heart. Mm -hmm. Having been what? Born again. You were obedient. You purified your souls. And in that process, what really occurred? Born again. You were born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By what? Or through. One translation says by the Word of God. This one says through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. The Holy Spirit gave the word to guide us. Now Luke 8, 11 says the seed of the kingdom is kingdom God. the word of God. Yeah, word the of seed God. of the kingdom is the word of God. Now, if you pull all these passages together and rethink the language of John 3 through the crucible of Matthew 7, Matthew 18, 3, and then 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, what do you say that the new birth is? It is a spiritual birth in, that is actually the result or involves us with hearing, believing, and obeying the what? The Word. The Gospel of Christ, the Word of God. There is the orientation. Now, if you ever study John chapter 3 with anyone and don't go to Matthew 7 and Matthew 18 and 1 Peter 1, you're going to miss the import of what is said in verse 22 and 23 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Question or comment? I've got a comment. Are we wrong when we like announce or put in our bulletin that we had like, we had a gospel meeting and then we had 10 baptized? I guess me coming from a denominational yep. church, mm -hmm. I look and I see that and I'm thinking, oh, this is the water. It's all about being baptized. So is yep. that the wrong terminology? I mean, us as a church... Well, we 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 you know, we mean more than that. Right, but, but yeah. we're saying that. But know? sometimes we fall into the habit of using language that we don't need to use. Yeah. We could use better language. We could say that there were, uh, there were. Ten, I read a, read a report. We had fourteen converts. Maybe yeah. Repeating about uh, We had fourteen converts. Uh, we had words, but you know, when you're coming, when you're on the outside looking yep. in, it you know looks like we've yeah. known for that's. All we yeah. do is baptize. Yeah. You know, uh, so we would say we would say so and so <laughs> obeyed the gospel this place yeah. Thursday yeah. night. I've, I've usually announced it that way. Yeah. That this this person obeyed from the heart the teachings of Jesus. This person obeyed the gospel. It's something to think about because, uh, admittedly, <coughs> there are some prejudices against <coughs> baptism, yeah. but sometimes we unfortunately accommodate that prejudice by using the term that they want to beat us over the head with. Right. Yeah, you know, coming from the other side is yeah. well how yeah. they yeah. think. What, yeah. you know. And they're done that. Yeah. So we need to be, I guess, more cautious. Just anything that we, well, we do is. You know, I think word cautious is, is appropriate, but yeah. carefully and sincerely communicate what we really believe. Right. We believe these people were saved. Exactly. Yeah. We believe these people were converted. We believe they were born again. But we end up talking and saying they were. Baptized. It's like that's the only thing that it took. You know, yeah. it didn't take all these other steps. Well, since you brought that up, <laughs> and it's just you know, it's just well, you know, coming straight yeah, up. Yeah, that, that always bothered me when I hear that. that you know, yeah. So it's always baptized. We know better, but yeah. you know, we don't want them to think it's it. Yeah. You know. Good comment. Appreciate it. Appreciate your your being with us. It did. We're so up to this today. Good. Very good.